आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा यू हैव ऑलवेज बीन वेरी अनचैरिटेबल अबाउट योर फर्स्ट फिल्म यू रिफ्यूज टू टॉक अबाउट इट एट ऑल बट एक्चुअली व्हाट वेंट रॉन्ग ए द स्टोरी वाज वेरी सेंटिमेंटल बट बिफोर दैट आई वाज कंसीडर्ड टू बी अ मैन ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग वन हु नोज सिनेमा वेरी वेल बिकॉज़ आई हैव बीन राइटिंग ऑन सिनेमा एंड पोएट्री सिनेमा एंड लिटरेचर the language of cinema and the cinema and dialectics cinema and the atmosphere environment these are the things so and then quite a number of people educated people and uh, who build opinions in the society they felt that here is a man who knows cinema very well and he can create something very interesting but i could see that i knew all this but then i didn't know the cinema being to a large extent extent being a technological performance i thought that i was not aware of the fact that i need to know the technology to a large extent at least to some extent i didn't know that the story a was very sentimental very bad even though you know i remember i met by beginning i mean when even when i was in school i was very fond of uh, all the saxley and then again i read many more other the best in world literature not to speak of bengali literature alone and it is a great pity that being in bengal i do not know much about the other areas other regional literature in india because of the fact that we didn't have many translations but then i was aware of all this but then when i wanted to make a film the story that was given to me and i found that it's quite good and it was not that it was thrust on me no it was this the story was very bad very sentimental and then again i didn't have any command over the over the technique of cinema so the all things combined well don't ask me to talk about it i feel so bad and so sick of it and this was a big disaster the biggest of all big disasters that could ever happen to a man i don't want to remember the t- title as well and i wouldn't tell you what is the title but you know about it very bad film it was like humiliating myself i felt totally humiliated and i didn't talk to people and that was the time when i felt that i should go back to other things as well this is cinema is not my cup of tea this is what i felt anyway eventually i came back to cinema i made another film that was a film based on a story by not the story that was based on an incident that happened to mahadevi barma that mayavadi poet so it was translated into bengali so her meeting with a chinese hawker selling his merchandise i mean china silk and all and uh, her meeting a chinese hawker and the interaction that followed and it was given to me and i wrote a script out of that and uh, that was produced by hemant kumar that was his first production he produced number of films not many but that was the first production he made in bengali it is called neel akash in niche under the blue sky that was about a chinese hawker and this woman she was uh, a part of the movement initiated by congress the woman was a habitual khadi wearer i don't know if mahadevi barma was a khadi wearer so she was a khadi wearer and then she didn't wear anything else other than khadi and she came across this very persuasive talker and a persuasive salesman the chinese hawker whoever knows anything about the chinese hawker there were plenty of such chinese hawkers in calcutta and so she wanted to wanted her to buy something and uh, this man chinese hawker he wanted her to buy something a china silk and finally she said i don't wear silk i don't wear anything other than khadi i i don't wear anything foreign immediately the man the salesman he said me foreign no no ni me not foreign me a chinese a china man me no foreign look look at my eyes my eyes not blue 
No foreign. Look at my nose. Not sharp. Not this. It is this. I mean, snubbed nose. And no foreign. Chinaman. So, he also felt that he was a foreigner means an Englishman, a colonial master. But he is no foreign. And that was how the relation started. And then there, this is sentimental, but this apart. And the film, I'm not very happy with the film, to be very frank with you, because uh, it was by and large, it was sentimental. Again, not that sentimental that much. It has elements of, I wanted to go away from that, do away with this. And then it was not, you know, the structurally, I was not very happy with it. But then I stand by its political content, which is the following that our struggle for national independence is inseparably linked up with the liberal world. I stand by its political content, which is the following, that our struggle for national independence is inseparably linked up with the democratic world's struggle against fascism. That was where we unite. That is where the fight of the democratic world against fascism comes close to our fight against the colonial masters. So that part, I think, I even today, I stand by that. It, so politically, I think I was on the right track. And that perhaps was liked by Nehru when he saw the film. Okay, and that was all. But even then, I wouldn't say that this was one of my most favorite films. But this was the film which gave me a go. I started moving onward since then. This is the first film that you shot on a location. Yes, mostly. And location has been a very important aspect of your filmmaking. Right. So talk about. Let us talk about the location thing. Perhaps the shooting on location was initiated. Not that the films were not shot on locations before that. I told you about this uh, Nimai Ghosh. He also shot the entire film on location. The Chinnamul. Chinnamul. But then. That didn't leave an impact on me. But then, Satujit Rai, when he made this film, Pathet Machali, except the night sequences, everything was shot on location. And that was what impressed me very much. So, he had a great lot to do. He had a great lot to do in shaping me that way. So that was why I did shooting on location. Then after that, I had been shooting on locations Bhuvan and Shum. also in the studios. Bhuvan Shum was shot entirely shot on location the... and then many more things. And what happens then, I realized, unlike Shutujit Rai, I grow on locations because he gets everything, Shutujit Rai gets everything in writing. And possibly he doesn't want to go beyond, I don't know to what extent he went beyond the words written in the script. But then I, for one, I have gone so many times outside my script. So people know, and I also say that I do improvise a lot. I grow on the location. This is what happened. Plenty of sequences which are considered to be very good by me and also by others, considered to be very important sequences in the films, in those films, these, those were just done on the spot. Done on the spot. There was no scribbling even. I took one shot. And then I didn't know what should be the next shot. And the next shot was taken again. So it, something happened. It grew out of the first shot, the way I will take the second shot, something like this. And this happened to me. And I know, I, if not anything else, I know how to do the editing. I feel very enormous, you know, very expansive when I go to my dressing room. That means editing room. I start dressing my films the way I do. Very different from what was there in the script, and what was even in my thinking during shooting. And uh, I remember Fellini also used to do that. Federico Fellini, he used to improvise a lot. And once in the United States, in America, some film bobs asked him, so what about your, they would say something about your improvisations. And Fellini was furious. He said, no, don't say improvisations. I never improvise. You know, filmmaking is very mathematically very precise. And what do I do? When I shoot a film, I have my ears open, I have my eyes open. And during this 
brilliant journey, marvelous journey. I keep my ears and eyes open, and a lot of things come there. So you can't call it improvisation. But whatever he says, it is improvisation yes. this way or the other. Do you remember I told you about a letter which I wrote to my wife? Yes, I was coming to that because talking about Baishya Shravan, one must take another jump of two decades to come to mm. Akadish Shandhani. Mm. Because the two films are very closely related. It's almost one follows from another. Yeah. And I think he wanted to shoot in the same location also, which was not possible. Mm. Yes. You know, Akalesh Baisha Sarabhama was shot in 59-60 and the yes. film was made in 60. And then it was mostly on location and the night sequences were done in the studios. And uh, like what Rai did. When in 1918, between I made many films and then in 1980, I made Akalesh Sandhani. In Baisha Sarabhama, there was a reference to the war, the famine and all. But it was not a film on famine. It was primarily the relationship between man and a woman. And the age between the man and the woman was embarrassingly wide. The woman was beautiful, very sweet. The man by Indian standard was ugly. But many Europeans liked the man very much. Anyway, so it started. It is the relationship between a man and a woman. And then the war and the famine acted as a backdrop. Not the backdrop, I would say it acted as a catalytic agent towards the end. How we wanted to show how the relationship deteriorates, how it grows so terrible, the relationship. How the last vestige of human decency is lost during the war. And that also how it affects the man and the woman, the relationship. But in 1980, when I wanted to make this film, Akale Shandani, this was about a group of filmmakers. I mean, a director, his technicians, and his actors. He, with his people, invaded a village, a typical village in Bengal, to make a film about 43 What's famine. You know, with great deal of knowledge of cinema and with great deal of knowledge of the 1943 famine, with history on the back, they went to the village to make a film on the famine. And it was in 1980. So, and uh, it was all about the interaction, how the past walks into the present. My, the same theme coming in different ways, different forms. The past, the 43, walks into the present, becomes the famine continues to be a continuing phenomenon, even today. This is what I wanted to show. And the other things, it is a, to my mind, it is a multi-layered film. Yes. It operates at very many levels. And, and a film within a film. Film within a film, yes. And there, one day, I remember at night, in the middle of the night, I wrote a letter to my wife, who incidentally happens to be my actress in some of my films. And she acts very well, extremely well. And uh, so it is difficult to make a film, but it is much more difficult to direct a wife because she always questions your integrity and which others couldn't. And uh, so even then, I find her to be very, very sensitive. And uh, so she was not in Baishya Sabun. She played and uh, not a mother, the wife of a... The old landlord. Old landlord. I mean, this landlordism, there is nothing of landlordism there. It was in shambles, total shambles. She played that woman. And now you are talking about your technological aspect. Yes. You said you are not very sure about... Did that start from Akash Kushum? With those famous well, shots. even before that, in Baishya Sabun, Baishya Sabun, I made it, and it had nothing to do with Pothar Panchali, but Pothar Panchali was shot in a village. And Pothar Panchali is a rural story. Pothar Panchali is not about the farmers. In the same way, Baishya Sabun is also short, is not the story of the farmers. They uh, belong to the lower middle class, the milieu, and as much as Pothar Panchali's characters were. And there was an old woman in Pothet Panchali, marvelous. And here also, there is an old woman in Baisha Savan. But even then, I wouldn't say that... Uh, this is too superficial. Uh, when the people say that uh, it has something to do with Pothet Panchali. But Pothet Panchali must have helped me a lot. You know, must have given me the courage, the conviction to go forward with it. But then, 
in my film Baisha Sabun, there is there are plenty of I mean plenty of beautiful locations. I mean rural scenes, the paddy fields, the open fields, the you know the horizon lines. Plenty of such things are there, but you will not find one single such shot without people, without the face of a man, the working man. Because to me, a beautiful scenery doesn't attract me as long as the scenes are punctuated by the faces of human beings. That is what you will find. And then after that, it was Akash Kusum in 1965, where I did a lot. I played with the, with the equipment. I played with the machine. It is like a child playing with the building blocks. So you can make anything you like. So that is what I did. I even used plenty of steel photographs. And that was the time, I must confess, I saw a couple of films by Truffaut, where he used a lot of freezes. And I fell in love with the freezes. And in my film, Akash Kusum, I brought a truckload of freezes. And this is what happens when you are deeply impressed by somebody. So I wish I used it, the freezes and all, and the photographs also. I used them much more. I should have exercised a bit of restraint to do that. It was too much. It was overdone, I think. But even then, that was the beginning of certain things that I came to know. I could see the horizon line is changing. I could see that I could go beyond the, the border lines built by our predecessors. I could see that uh, it is very important. It was obligatory on the part of the new filmmakers to violate the border lines. And you have to create new border lines, and that too needs to be violated, needs to be broken. Yes, this is the point I was also coming to, because Akash Kushum marks the end of the first decade of your career as a filmmaker. Yes. Now, within this decade, if you look at your films, uh, we find that we, you have tried your best to work within the parameters of the commercial cinema. Well, yes, in a way, yes. And you tried a few comedies? Yes, too. I did. Mm. So, but uh, you never felt satisfied? No, I'm never even, if you ask me, I'm not satisfied even today. Every time I make a film, don't try to provoke me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd come out with many things. Every time I make a film, and I happen to be my first spectator, and I watch my films, I wish I could treat the whole thing as a dress rehearsal so that I, so that I could start over again. And that is one reason why when you sort of, or for anybody, for that matter, anybody else, say some good things about any of my films, I feel very happy. For obvious reason, I feel very happy, very satisfied. But on the other hand, I feel very uncomfortable and a bit guilty. I feel that this could be... I know the lapses. I know that there, nothing is the last word. You know, even Eisenstein wouldn't say that this is the last word. I don't know, even Tagore, when he writes a poem, would say this is the last thing I could do. It could still be better. So. This is what I have been doing. I am never, never happy. The moment you are very happy, at a certain point of time, I say I made a good film. No, and then when I watch a film, and then my own film, and I like it, or I take a very good shot, I like it, and then I go to my room. I go to my toilet, and there I face the mirror. Nobody sees me in the toilet. And then I speak to myself, I said, there must be a streak of genius in me, otherwise how could it happen? How could a film like this could be made? But I wouldn't say it to other people, of course. That, that was uh, the director of Bicycle Tips, Disika. He was talking to a journalist, he said, oh, Disika is a very good film, I must say. So I liked it very much. It was uh, like a child he was saying like that. It was so good that he, it also didn't escape him. And he said that it's a very good film. So that way I feel unhappy at times, I feel happy. And then uh, even today, if you ask me to make all my films over again, maybe I will not make, even given the time. And the, if I live longer, well, I will do that. And what is true of my films is also true of my own life. Have you ever thought of remaking a film like Hitchcock did? Well, yes, of course, I want to do that. I want to do that. I wish I could remake the film, giving a different interpretation to the whole thing. I feel like that. The same about my life. I wish, because as you started from the beginning that you were 75, I don't look it. But then um, when people say it, well, I always feel 
I tell you very honestly, I have no regrets. I have lived a very long life and I have built a very long career. But then, the only regret I have is that I cannot live my life over again. I cannot live my life over again. That was in one of my films, later films, Ek Din Achanak. So, this is a regret I have. Had I been able to start my life over again, starting from the scratch, from a zero point, possibly, I could have corrected the conclusions which I made earlier. Correcting conclusions is a very important thing in life, everyone's life. That day we were talking about interpretation of text, because I'm coming to that because immediately after Akash Kushum you tried Matira Manisho, which is a classic in real literature, which won Shahid Academy Award and a very popular novel. Mm. But when you made a film out of it, you did not stick to the original. You changed it, you transformed it in various ways. And I think from that point onwards, there has been a continuous battle with you and your original novelists or story writers whom you picked up. Because you have always... Well, it has changed. always been so. Not that I have always very bad relation with my story writers. But no, then I'm not talking about relation. It's talking about your attitude. Well, it happens like this, because whenever I take up a story, and ultimately I have seen that uh, the stories are used as a take-off point. From there I take off to something which was not in the text, every time. That is one reason why I do not go in for big writers like Sharad Chattopadhyay, like Bonkip Chattopadhyay, like uh, Rabindranath Tagore, because I will go my own way, I tell you why. You know, when I make a film and uh, I have three mistresses to serve, it sounds very odd, but then serving three mistresses at the same time and with equal passion, with intense passion and love, serving three mistresses at the same time is a very difficult task, but I have to do that when making a film. The first mistress is the text written by someone at a particular period of time, okay? The second mistress is my medium having its artistic norms. And uh, I can break the norms within a parameter. Then I can even go beyond that. So, I mean, I'm talking about the medium. It has its own forms, own attitudes, its own way of getting things done. That is the second mistress. Here, cinema. Cinema is my, the language, I have to speak everything, I mean, recreate everything in terms of language of cinema, with sound and image. And the third mistress, the most important of all mistresses, and the most exacting of all mistresses, if not most important, but the most exacting of all the mistresses is my own time. My own time, I have to be very faithful to my time. This is what I have said a number of times during the interview. I don't want to look at the text as a museum piece. I have to see, I have to look at it as something which is very intimate to me. I have to make it very valid for the contemporary man. So what I have to do, I have to infest the story with the text, my first mistress, I have to invest this story with the contemporary sensibilities. And as I do that, I, it is my prerogative as a filmmaker, I feel, very honestly I feel, I, have, I can even go to the extent of being critical of the text. And that was what happened in very large measure in Kalindi Panikrahi's this uh, Munishu. It was a book loved by many people in Orissa. It was a book treasured by the academics. It was a book which was a text which used to be a text in the postgraduate classes. It was a book which got the Academy, Shait Academy Award. But then when I made the film, the story was written in 30s, but I made the film in 65, 66. So what did I do? I could see the relationship about the relationship and all without distracting from the accuracy of the text, I mean in terms of the physical details, without going beyond that, within the parameter, all that I did, I infested the story and the relationship with the contemporary sensibilities. That way, 
whoever knows the story knows about two brothers, the younger brother. And according to, if you read the book, you get the feeling, Kalindi Babu didn't say in so many words, but you get the feeling it is the second brother's wife who does the housebreaking. I refuse to accept it, and then I feel that she is as important as the elder brother's wife, who by then has become the wife of the head of the family. As the wife of the head of the family, the elder brother's wife enjoys certain privileges, which again, when she came as a wife, after the, the elder brother was first married, the wife of the head of the family was her the mother-in-law. But after the death of the mother-in-law, it is, and after the death of the father-in-law, it is the elder brother who became becomes the head of the family. And so, wife of the head of the family enjoys certain privileges. It is the same chain rotating. And then the younger brother's wife has to be like younger brother's wife. And there she revolts. She revolts internally. And uh, when she does something, on when she tells something to the husband, it is not that she was trying to provoke the husband to run away from this family. It is not that at all. I think she is entitled to the same privileges which the elder brother's wife gets. So that way, this was not liked by the academics in Orissa. They could sue me in the court of law. That was the feeling. But then this is what I did, and this is what I have been doing in, every, in all my films. Even when I made this film, my latest film, I wouldn't say last, Anturin, it was based on a story by Sadat Hassan Mantu. Sada it's very, very difficult. After the, after the film was shown in the festival, a gentleman from Delhi, it was shown in Calcutta. The festival took place in Calcutta at that time. A gentleman in Delhi who did, I mean, some scholastic study, Manto, he asked me which story you had in view, <laughs> which story you based your film on. I said, this is a quiz for you. Try to find it out. Where from did I get it? So it was like that. And it happened with Premchand's son as well. Premchand's son, Amrit Rai. He said, I do not agree with your interpretation. So that way, you know, the how the time helps in giving a revolutionary interpretation to the original text. And this and story, you totally changed us, Khandar. Khandar, yes. From the original. Well, I did. Totally changed it yes. in every aspect. This is what I did to a large extent. And it was, you know, Premin Mitra, the, the writer. Hmm. He said, Minal, you do it. And uh, the only condition I have on you is that I must see it before I get totally blind. He was losing his eyesight. And he saw the film and he was very happy. I said, Premenda, have you seen to what extent I have de deviated from your story? I didn't tell you all that. It doesn't matter at all. It is my story. I would say it is my story. And Bonafoul also said the same thing when I made uh, Bhuvan Shom. I said, yes, it is Minal Sen's Bhuvan Shom, but then it is also my Bhuvan Shom. He said it. You mustn't look at anything as a museum piece to be stored in a showcase. You must look at it as something which is invested with contemporary sensibilities, it becomes a contemporary phenomenon. So at the greatest example, in recent times, I mean, in a period of 200 years, look at Michael Madhusudan, that what he did. He became a rebel. I am not the person to talk about Michael Madhusudan, that because I am not a literary man. I am no student of literature. But even then, I feel what I say. You know, Madhusudan, that he embraced Christianity, not out of love, for any theology, but as a protest against the badly organized state of things in Hindu society at that time in the 19th century. He became a Christian as a protest, not because he loved Christianity. And then when he came here, he took up one chapter from Ramayana and wrote Meghnad Bhat Kabbu about the killing of Meghnad, Ravan's son. And he said, I hate Rama and his rebel. He said it. It is not my statement. It is Michael Madhusudan Dattwe. It is on record. He said, I hate Rama and his rebel. My sympathy is with Ravanam. And if I say that when he said it, he was possibly very much under the influence of French Revolution. He was very much under the influence of 
Many other things happening in Europe. He said it. So a man undergoing a process of protest, you know, he could say like this. Now look at Irabhati Karve, who redefined Mahabharata in more ways than one. Irabhati Karve, the yes. Maharashtrian great lady. Or if you go to Kamman in Tamil Nadu, how he has also, in his own time, he redefined Ramayana and Mahabharata, Kamban. I know nothing about it except that I heard about this thing. I read about this, that's all. So this, I think, is very important. I mean, reflecting your own time and correcting the conclusions arrived at by the writer, by the creator. And in the same way, I reflecting my own time, I can correct myself as I was. 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So it is a continuously growing phenomenon, the life, yours and mine and everybody's. Now, there is a related question to this when you're talking about the text. You are probably the only filmmaker in the world who has made film in four languages, four oh, totally yes. different languages. Mm -hmm. And you are planning to make it in the fifth language also, Malayalam, yes. which did not take place. How do you feel confident since you don't know those languages at all? I know. Aren't I you know. scared that there will be something wrong in the script? What are you trying to convey? With Very design? much, but at the same time, I also, I take it as a challenge. A challenge is very foolish in many ways. But then nothing like making a film in your own language because you know the nuances. And when you have to break your words, you have to break your sentences. If you have to speak this incomplete sentences, your characters, this is how you can capture the interior world of the characters. This you can't do with other, if you have to make films in other languages. For instance, when I made a film in Hindi, later on I made a number of Hindi films which were liked by the people. I always wished I made these films in Bengali. I always write the script in Bengali and then I sit down with a man who knows the language, for instance Hindi. The other day I asked Shabana who acted in three of my Hindi films, and I asked her, do you think my Hindi has improved over the years? She said, not really, Dada, but you have become more desperate with the language. So I have become desperate with the language, I don't know. But then when I come to film a something, well, in Hindi, then I can't be desperate. So I have to depend on this. So there also, I have a lot of problems. After the whole thing is, the shot is enacted, then I asked somebody, did she say this? Yes. How did you say it? And that is how things are done. So I have to depend to a large extent on the actors as well, and on the writer, the translator. And then I always ask the translators not to give me the literal translation. I say, this is what I feel. Try to do something about it. And then I try to understand, the, I try to feel the music of the language. You know, when I write, rhythm of the language. So these are the things which I try to understand. And then when I made a film in Oriya, it was the same thing, and in addition to that, I had another problem. I had another problem because I had some, all Bengalis have some sort of reservation about their neighbor's languages. That uh, normally we have to make efforts to understand somebody else's language, but we make efforts not to understand Oriya, even though Oriya happens to be very close to Bengali. And so I had my reservations about it. But then when I started making the film, I could listen to the, I could, I remember, as I told you earlier, I remember this, Mr. Shuniti Chattopadhyay, how he loved it, how he wanted the other people also to know the language, to know the music of the language. And that was it. So it was done like that. And then a lot of things happened right on the spot. Then, for instance, there's Telugu, which I didn't understand. I didn't understand a word of it. And now I had many other problems as far as this Telugu film is concerned. Telugu film is based on a story by Prem Chand. And Prem Chand, when he wrote the story, he had a village of Uttar Pradesh as the model. And when I wrote the script, I had a village in Bengal as my model. And the whole thing was transplanted in Telangana. Now, again, Prem Chand's story, Kafan, was during winter. And in Bengal, the winter is not that's severe. And in Telangana, there is no winter at all. But then I decided, I, when I realized that my film is, you know, my film focuses, the story focuses on poverty and exploitation. 
since poverty and exploitation cannot have two different cultures, two different stories to tell, and poverty and exploitation do not depend on the seasonal changes, so it doesn't matter if I do it in winter or if I do it hot summertime. That was how I did. And then the language, language part. I got it written by so many people. Everybody says, and they, I, somebody writes it, and then it goes to other person, he says, nothing is done. They, he couldn't capture your, the thing, that is. And I can tell you two stories about it. Yes, please. You know, when uh, I had the use of a man without having any formal education in schools, I just went to, before I went there, I went to Sundaraya, that Communist Party chief, who was alive at that time, and who did the, that great agrarian the action in Telangana. It was he who led this whole thing. So he knows absolutely everything about the whole of Telangana. So I asked him, could he give me, give somebody with me, whom he knows and who he relies on, can he go with me, to be with me, always with me. And he didn't think twice. He said, here is a man, Krishnamurti, who will go with you, who will be staying with you, and he will help you in many ways. And Krishnamurti told me in Hindi, Urdu, that Minal Sab, I learned Marxism not by reading books, because I can't read that much. I was not educated in school. I learned Marxism through Shanghars. That is what he said, through conflict. And then here is a man, who escaped jails four times. And he was with me, and he was amazing the man as he was. He knew absolutely everything about the whole thing. And it's so much so that my actress, Mamata Shankar, who happens to be a Bengali, or who, like Smita Patil, can fit very well as a South Indian, as a Gujarati girl, as a Bengali girl, as a Maharashtrian girl. So these are the common features in both of them. And Mamata Shankar wouldn't move an inch without Krishnamurti ji at her side. So one day, I asked my Telugu assistant to read out a sequence. And there is a line. Some of the people, the villagers, were talking about Ghishu. He was Bhinkaya in the film. Ghishu, the character in the Prem Chand's story. This man is eats and chews and sleeps like a buffalo. This is what we have in Bengali. It is a Bengali proverb. He chews, eats, and sleeps like a buffalo. And uh, the man who did the translation, a good playwright, I am told, in Hyderabad, he did it. And when it was read out to Krishnamurti, he got furious. He said, Minal Sahib, you can say that. I can see that you are coming from the city. There's no one living in the village no farmer will talk like that. Buffalo is our life. You can't say this, that buffalo is lazy. Immediately I changed it. I just took it out. Because this is what we do. Had I made this film in Bengali, I would have used a certain dialect, and an actor could have used the dialect, spoke the dialect very well, and then a critic, city-made critic, he would have said he did a very good job. But that would have been very wrong, I could see. These are the good things of working in an alien world. And then again, there is something else. Ghishu said at a certain, Ghishu means Vengaya. Okay. It is not in the book, but in the story. Ghishu said, Ghishu said about these villages, if you walk on the leaves, if you walk on the branches, I walk on the leaves. We have something like this in Bengali, and you have the same thing in Hindi. What is that? Dal, dal, pat, pat, something like this. If you walk on the branches of the tree, I walk on the leaves of the tree. Yeah. So the man who translated, he said, I never heard of it, but very interesting, very good. Should I do it? Should I write it in um, Telugu? I said, why not? And this is what he did. And when it was read out to Krishnamurti, he was also very happy. Ah, very good. That I am more clever than you. After half an hour, he came back. Minal sir, have you taken the shot? I said, no, not yet. Why? We have another line like this. Here, in this area. I said, is it very popular? Everybody, even the poorest of the poor people say this. I said, what is that? And what is said? That was a piece of poetry. And he said, if I translate into English, it is like this. If you walk on the clouds, I walk on the stars. I immediately had it. It is so beautiful, so marvelous.
So that was it. So you get wonders when you are in a foreign, in an alien world. But then, at the same time, I must say, in the ultimate analysis, nothing like making a film in your own language when you know the nuances, when you have complete command over the language.